let me first uh, thank uh, Percy and Michel Bibiorca for inviting me to his session and therefore to allow me to present some remarks related to my current research uh, to this distinguished, distinguished audience. Um, from the menu that was offered to me in terms of the topics that uh, this Congress highlights, I chose to speak about war because it is the closest to the, my current research on power relationships. Indeed, uh, war, we know, is, has always been and still is a defining trend of society throughout history. War is a specific form of exercising power relationships. And power relationships are the foundations of society as they determine the norms and values that are institutionalized in the organizational forms that shape social behavior and social practice. Power is based both on coercion and persuasion. Persuasion works through the construction of meaning in the human mind, primarily around processes developed in the communication realm. Coercion is exercised by the institution monopoly of violence, in a classic tradition of analysis, uh, legitimate or not, by the way. When this monopoly of violence is challenged, then war follows. And war, therefore, is the exercise of power by unrestricted violent means. War can be between state actors or non-state actors, or between states and their own citizens, or between states and configurations of non-state actors, be it social movements, social protests, or cultural challenges to the values and interests institutionalized in a given state or coalition of states. But each specific type of society, each historical type of society, has a specific form of war. And therefore, our society, the network society, uh, the social structure that subsumed the previous historical type, the industrial society, has also a specific type of war. The network society, uh, something social structure that I identified and analyzed empirically in my work over the last two decades, is the social structure whose core activities and institutions are organized not only on the basis of networks, but networks uh, powered by digital communication technologies. War in the network society is mainly enacted by um, what we call in the research field on this matter, net wars. Although, in, as happens in other dimensions of social organization, net wars coexist also with wars from previous forms of social organization. And therefore, there is a coexistence in today's practice of unmanned drones practicing telebombing with machete welding massacres performed by bandits fighting bandits in government and by bandits in government terrorizing their populations to protect their predatory status. Yet, as in other dimensions of the network society, be financial markets or network politics, the dominant form of war at the global level, the one that ultimately determines who prevails in the monopoly of violence is represented by the network, that is, the war organized in networks fighting other networks. So the gradual rise <coughs> of networks has been studied for the last two decades by a number of researchers, including John Arkila and David Rontham. Here, in this very brief presentation, I will define it. I then will refer to the sources of networks, and I will finally examine the consequences of new this new form of war for society at large. Networks, as all wars, have two forms of practice that combine with each other. On the one hand, they are information wars, enacted via communication networks to shape human minds to support or undermine a certain set of interests and values. A good example is the study I completed a couple of years ago about the analysis of information and communication uh, processes to uh, construct the American mind uh, allowing uh, the Iraq war. The Zapatistas on the other side 
mobilizing against globalization, were conceptualized as one of the first significant informational guerrillas, one that uh, aimed at staging theatrical violence to oppose and denounce the social and cultural destruction induced by uncontrolled globalization. On the other hand, there are also terrorist networks and counter-terrorist networks using extreme violence exercised by networks of smart weapons. These smart weapons being either human bombs or flying robots. The dynamics of wars result always from specific organizational forms linked to the state of technology in society. Network forms of organization built on information and communication technologies powered networks are more effective than vertical bureaucracies and this is both for non-state actors and for state-based military forces. Three consequences follow. First, organizational transformation increases the power of non-state actors that by forming networks become less vulnerable. Whoever masters the network form stands to gain. This includes information, coordination, and propaganda over internet networks. Second, technological organization opens the way to cyber wars and robot wars. These are not science fiction. This is current practice. Even such a deeply sociological uh, publication as The Economist titled this week, Cyber Wars, uh, as the main topic. Cyber wars aim at hacking essential communication infrastructure of societies as, and also as a way to prevail in no politics, the politics of the information sphere. On the other hand, robot wars are currently being practiced in conflict, in conflicts such as Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Iraq, but they are on the rise toward the future. They had been documented already by a number of analysts, including Peter Stinger. Already in the operational stage, there are flying spy robots, size of a briefcase, detecting the enemy before obliterating it. Thousands of robots, including drones, exist now. And tens of thousands of robots are being produced and put into practice. We have shifted from centralized war, including the possibility of nuclear war, to decentralized drones attacks based on information on the ground and satellite imaging. And as all organizational technological transformations, this has social roots and social consequences. One of the um, social dimensions is that uh, warriors have changed. These are not anymore West Point trained Air Force fighter pilots. These are teenagers recruiting from the high schools of the United States because of their capacity to manipulate video games, because their excellence in shooting little Martians on the screen. Therefore, wars become largely video games practiced by military officers in a nine to five schedule in some place in the Nevada desert. War becomes an abstract game of shooting abstract symbols on the screen of a uh, computer, but of course with some drone, some robot, uh, thousands of miles from there doing their work. By the way, this has demoralized a uh, number of traditional Air Force uh, warriors who are criticizing this approach. Third, the process and outcome of conflicts depends increasingly on the management of the connection between the connection to the networks of the human mind and the connection between networks of destruction, both ultimately dependent on communication networks. But where networks come from? Which are the, the, the sources, the main sources of this kind of wars in our society? It arises from the structural sources of violent conflict in the global network society. First, the information and communication technology revolution powers networks, is the infrastructural condition for these networks to operate, and networks under these technological conditions become more effective 
than hierarchical, vertically organized military bureaucracies unlike in any moment in previous history. Second, the global network society is based both on inclusion and exclusion, economic and cultural. And so the project of a cultural homogeneous globalization, the world is flat, um, is confronted by the assertion of identity in its multiple dimensions. The world is not flat unless you flatten it with bombs. New non-state actors are mainly identity-based and engage in conflicts that are not negotiable. They refer to values, as in religion, nationalism, ethnicity, territoriality. Third, the exclusion of large segments of the population from the global network connection leads to what I have labeled in my analysis the perverse connection, that is, uh, the, global, the emergence of a global criminal economy that connects to the global economy those segments that are marginalized. This global criminal economy challenges the institutions of the state and when confronted, like in Mexico, engages in terrorist war making. Fourth, because of extreme imbalance of power between states in the aftermath of the end of the Cold War equilibrium, non-state actors and even state actors engage in what is called asymmetrical confrontation, meaning different forms which are not the direct military capacity, but seizing advantage in um, actions which inflict massive destruction without confronting organized military forces. Usually this happens through networks aimed at restoring the balance of power vis-a-vis -vis dominant states by disrupting the usual functioning of their societies. This leads to a transformation of the forms of war making. The absence of command and control centers means that the fight is conducted by networks that are decentralized and capable to reconfigure themselves autonomously. It also means that the states adapt to these new dangers, to these challenges, to their monopoly of violence. And therefore, the states network with each other as well, and they build decentralized networks within the structure of the violent um, enforcement institutions of the state. States network with each other, including their intelligence and military operations, and they keep trying to destroy challenging networks by identifying nodes in the network. And they still believe that the answer is the technology. That's the issue with drones. Under these conditions, the communication networks become critical. First, because attacking the physical structure of communication networks becomes a major aim in any war making. Networks attack networks by destroying the infrastructure of network communication. Second, and most importantly, networks are essential because communication networks are decisive in shaping the human mind by acting on multimedia communication networks. This is both enacted uh, from the challengers, for instance, uh, inducing terror in the population, and from states dealing with the global insurgency, using, for instance, the war on terror to mobilize and subdue their citizens. And actually, uh, this is the analysis that underlies my work on the Iraq war and the communication strategy of the Bush administration. The key idea here is that the essential battle is always the battle over the human mind. This conditions everything else. And this battle over the human mind depends on the battle that is played out in the multimedia communication networks. Al-Qaeda is an idea, not an organization. The project of Bin Laden is to make believe every young Muslim in the world that he or she is Al-Qaeda. The Zapatista, the first information on guerrilla, used the mask. The mask, in fact, is a collective face so that anyone wearing a mask becomes the leader of the revolution. On the other hand, the counterinsurgency counter strategy has gone beyond psychological warfare, the PSYOP traditional 
to use the most advanced tools of cognitive science. That's how the war on terror uh, image was designed, coined, and effectively used in the post-9-11 um, moment to create uh, what some people have called weapons of mass deception. By the way, that's one of the reasons why President Obama, after elected, changed his terminology uh, without entering into changing the strategies, um, not using anymore the war on terror metaphor. State actors often use networks of non-state actors. For instance, Iran or Pakistan do this. So, and therefore, the whole system works as an articulation of traditional interstate conflicts with a state networks conflict and with a battle over human minds in the communication field. Now, which are the social consequences of this organizational, psychological, and technological transformation of warfare in the network society? Well, as long as social conflicts link to disruptive globalization do not have institutional channels of conflict management, what Craig alone referred before as the absence of, of a global government system, and the methodological nationalism that exists in our way to approach um, the issues at the stake in the world, as long as these social conflicts do not have global institutional challenges, channels of conflict management and governance, as long as these conflicts are rooted in non-negotiable identities and values, there is a perma-war. And in the condition of a perma-war that we are living through, civil liberties become a non-affordable luxury. High-tech wars are high cost in economic terms and low cost in human terms for the holder of information and technology, therefore increasing the level of inequality in war making. It's very tempting in front of the opposition of people in the world to war making to professionalize, robotize, and affect war making without involving human casualties in terms of the high tech um, states that engage in this kind of war. Moreover, and more important, I would say, networks induce the dehumanization of the enemy, little Martians in the screen, and makes possible to perpetuate the state of war from the perspective of the dominant states, as social control over the state is diminished by the invisibility of war in the domestic society engaging in warfare. This dehumanization triggers, therefore, reciprocally, an increasingly violent response from the dehumanized humans that then follow the, the asymmetrical confrontation logic. And the consequence is a long durée global state of emergency. Furthermore, the full use of violence requires to negate the humanity of the enemy. The enemy becomes a non-human. And therefore, terrorism, including terrorism from criminal organizations, requires also to negate its own humanity and the humanity of their victims, as argued, by the way, in several excellent ethnographic works on the subjectivity of martyrdom. These trends fragment humankind as a common species. For part of humans, the enemy has become a non-human. When identities become the running point at, under these conditions, identities are defined against the other. And so the principle of identity and the principle of, of opposition that define the orientation of human action merge. And they don't have any, any reference to a shared totality. There are no conflicts of interest or opposition between alternative projects. We reach a situation of pure violence, that is, of the negation of society. And this logic must be situated in the present context in the context of an economic crisis and in societies challenged by the imaginary of terrorism, the social foundation for tolerance disappears. 
in the context of an extraordinary technological revolution, with at the same time simultaneously a crisis of social coexistence, and globalization without global governance, the chances of escalating uh, violence in the forms of bioterrorism at the network level exist, as well as decentralized nuclear confrontation at the state actors level. Paradoxically, networks lead to the destruction of competing networks, therefore to the dissolution of the networking capacity of social organization and social actors, and therefore of the network society itself. Ultimately, the, the logic of networks induces the end of our capacity to live together as human species. By distributing extermination capacity in multiple networks, we face the disappearance not only of a given tribe, as in previous history, but of a human tribe. Unless deliberate, conscious human action can reverse the course. Unless the subject prevails over the networks, be it in financial markets, in terror networks, or in the drones networks. But for the subject to prevail over dehumanized networks, it has to be itself reconstructed around networks of consciousness. Thank you for your attention.